After writing two scripts that were eventually made into terrible movies, Barker was faced with a challenge. It was make it or break it for him. He had success in writing as his Books of Blood anthology were monumental and it propelled him into the limelight, but his movie career on the other hand had faltered horribly. Barker wanted just one more attempt, one more chance to get things right. Instead of having someone else make films based off of his work, he was going to take the directing chair and have final say on his next project. This would become Hellraiser. But what would the film be about? In Underworld, Barker's first picture, he made an original screenplay specifically for the film. In Rawhead Rex, he adapted one of his successful short stories for the screen. For Hellraiser, he did a little bit of both. He wrote a novella called The Hellbound Heart, but as he was writing it, he was also penning the screenplay. Both novella and screenplay were made conjointly. Barker shipped his idea overseas to America where he found success funding the film on the very first investor he asked, New World Pictures, owned by the notorious and impactful Roger Corman. So with a script in hand, funding in place, and an experienced film crew around him, Barker was to direct his first feature film, Hellraiser. I have such sights to show you. Welcome to the Hellbound Horror Show. Any non-horror fan that looks at Pinhead automatically recognizes him as one of the great slasher villains like Freddy or Jason, but Hellraiser isn't a slasher film. It's actually closer to a modern day messed up grim fairy tale. You have the innocent young heroine, the evil stepmother, and something dark and sinister driving the force behind the scenes. It's about the power of desire and what one is willing to do for the things they think they want. Hellraiser is a love story at the end of the day with fantastical elements sprinkled throughout. It's uniquely original in that regard. At its core, Hellraiser is a love story, telling the story of forbidden love and lust within a family threatened with turbulent domestic relationships. The film starts with Frank at a foreign market buying a little puzzle box. Now this is actually a set, and if you would just pan the camera a couple inches to either side, you'd see the edge of the set. So the set was super small. Frank takes the puzzle box home and begins to play with it, trying to open it. Well, he does open it and all hell breaks loose. Now I figured this little puzzle box would try to hook you, but I didn't know it'd be like this. We get our first glimpse of the Cenobites in their realm and wow, they have cut up and torn off Frank's face. The torn up face of Frank was actually a failed practical effect. It was meant to melt into the floor, which makes sense of how Frank ends up under the floorboards later, but the effect didn't really work. They did keep in the puzzle piece face in the final film, but they cut from an early so you don't see the melting. We are then introduced to Frank's brother Larry and his wife Julia. They are moving into the house where Frank had been staying. You can tell right away that Julia is a bit distant towards her husband Larry for reasons we will soon find out. The film was pretty much shot in order. There were a few sets that they used like the foreign shop, the hospital, the labyrinth, and a few shots of the attic, but the house that they shoot in is an actual house. According to Ashley Lawrence, the house was so cheap to use because apparently there was a past incident where someone gassed themselves in the house. Yikes. Speaking of Ashley Lawrence, she plays Larry's daughter Kirsty, who doesn't live with them but visits from time to time as she's an adult now and on her own. We find out through flashbacks that Julia had an affair with Larry's brother Frank. It was a bit rapey but that's all Julia can think about and she longs for him. As the movers bring the bed upstairs, Larry cuts his hand on a rusty nail. He's in a fan of blood and brings his bleeding hand up to the attic to find Julia. Blood drips onto the floor, which will eventually resurrect Frank. This resurrection scene was actually added near the end of filming. Originally, it was written and shot very plainly, thinking they didn't have the budget to make something elaborate. The script called for the blood to seep into the floor, then they take Larry to the hospital, and then Frank's skinless body would appear later in the attic. New World Pictures was super excited for Hellraiser as they were seeing the dailies in LA. New World Pictures thought they had a franchise on their hands, their very own version of Freddy or Jason. So they gave an 
extra 25 grand to add the resurrection scene, and what a scene it is! It's one of the highlights of the film for sure. A lot of reverse photography and melty waxy gore. I love it, and fans do too. Well, Julia stumbles upon the skinless Frank in the attic, and at first she's appalled. But once she realizes it's Frank, feelings come flooding back. Frank needs more blood in order for him to gain strength and fully resurrect. He needs Julia to kill for him. After some thought, she agrees to help her lover. Yes. I will. That night, our lead Kirsty has a terrible nightmare with feathers and a bloody sheet. This was inspired by Dario Argento's Suspiria. Julia goes to the local bar during the day looking for men to bring home. These men think they'll be able to get inside of Julia, but they don't realize that the person waiting in the shadows wants inside of them. During the scene with the hammer, they originally had three on-screen hits, with one shot being a close-up of the skull as the hammer hit it. But of course, the NPAA said that this was too excessive. They said one hit is fine, but the second and third hit are a bit sadistic. Barker jokingly thinks that the first hit would also be sadistic, but what does he know? After draining the blood, Frank has become a lot stronger and more put together, but he still needs more. Julia, although distraught by the murder, is all in on her desire for Frank. While at work at the pet shop, Kirsty meets a hobo face to face. Now, Barker originally wanted to play the hobo who eats the crickets in the pet shop, but because of how behind they were and how short of a shoot it was, he didn't have time to go through the elaborate makeup process. It's a real shame though, because those crickets look yummy. Kirstie goes to visit her father and Julia, but here's something in the attic. Frank is feeding on another poor hapless sap that Julia brought over when he runs into Kirstie. Through some dialogue, Kirstie finds out that this skinless mess is her uncle Frank. If you couldn't already tell, Frank is a total creep and wants to have sex with his niece. Kirsty is feisty though and kicks him in the balls and grabs his stupid box. She tosses it through the window and escapes, picking up the box on her way out. The next thing she knows is that she wakes up in a hospital. She has to warn her father, but the hospital staff makes her wait. As she waits, she plays with the puzzle box and unlocks it. Now here is the true showstopper in the movie. She meets the engineer, a creature that often has people behind it, pushing it through a paper thin labyrinth. We also meet all the other Cenobites. There's the lead Cenobite played by Doug Bradley, a lifelong friend of Barker's. Doug Bradley actually had the option to either play a mover role where he could show his face or a lead Cenobite role where he would be covered in makeup. As an up and coming actor, he thought if future casting directors could see his actual face in the movie, it would be better for his career, but he ultimately chose Pinhead. Pinhead was the nickname for the lead Cenobite and one that Barker didn't particularly like, but the name stuck. We also have the female Cenobite, who's a girl, and that's basically like her main characteristic. Apparently the actress hated looking like that and wouldn't return to the sequel because of how ugly it made her look. We also have Butterball, who's the surgeon of the group. And don't forget the fan favorite, the Chatterer, who is basically the group's pet. Originally, the Chatterer was to have pointed teeth, as well as hunching over and acting like a monkey. The chattering teeth was inspired by monkeys, but they thought the posture and the sharp teeth took away from the human element. I freaking love the Cenobites and the elegantness of them. They are demons, yet they're so regal. They don't torture for the sake of it. People seek them out, seek out their pleasures seek out their pain. Cenobites merely provide a service. Kirsty is a smart girl and reminds these hell angels that Frank escaped their clutches and that she can bring them to him. Can Kirsty escape the clutches of the Cenobites? Will her father be okay? What is to happen to Julia and Frank? And who made all these weird lightning effects at the end of the film? I'm not gonna answer the questions and spoil the film, but let's talk about those lightning effects. Well, they ran out of time and they ran out of money so they couldn't work on the special effects at the end, so Barker had to go to a special effects studio in Greece. Barker got drunk on Greek beer and hand animated all the electricity at the end of the film by himself. Hellraiser is one of my favorite horror films, and I first saw it when I was relatively new to the genre. I had seen A Nightmare on Elm Street when I was around 11 to 12 years old. I skipped Jason movies, I skipped Michael Meyer, I went straight 
to the Hellraiser series. I fell in love with Clive Barker, and I remember getting the Hellbound Heart for Christmas when I was about 13 years old. And I'm not the only one who loves this movie. Hellraiser was super successful and pushed Barker into stardom. Not only was he a famous author, he now broke into the film business and his gamble paid off, big time. He made a classic horror film and of course, the pressure was on to make another. At the time of making Hellraiser, Barker was not happy with the state of the horror film landscape in the mid to late 80s. If you are talking about a movie which is solely based upon Psychos on the Loose, for instance, the Jason movies, the Friday the 13th pictures, in which you take vulnerable teenagers and you just kill them one by one with machetes or whatever else, I think that's uh, unhealthy. I don't write Psycho on the Loose stories. While he loved the first Nightmare on Elm Street, he thought the sequels made Kruger into a culture hero. Fans and audiences loved Freddy and Jason, but Barker hated that. He didn't like audiences cheering or being entertained by the murdering of innocent kids on screen. The Nightmare on Elm Street pictures, I must say, that make kind of heroes or culture heroes of the, the man in the mask, the man with the machete. Those pictures actually get cheers for the murderers. Barker was more of a fan of fantastical horror, which contained deep-rooted metaphors for the human psyche. While the original Hellraiser still holds Barker's standards for this, unfortunately, Pinhead would rise to fame and be celebrated by fans much to Barker's dismay. Hellraiser went on to have 10 sequels, with the most recent one coming out in 2022. After a decade after Hellraiser was released, Barker was tired of talking about it. This is the last time I will talk about that son of a bitch movie. He no longer felt like it was his own and had nothing left to say. He felt like, if anything, it had become Doug Bradley's baby as he was the one constant throughout all the films at the time. Barker would later go on to add to the Hellraiser mythos by writing the Scarlet Gospels in 2015, which starred Pinhead versus Harry Damore, his main character in many of his stories and in the film Lord of Illusions. Barker didn't have a ton to do with the Hellraiser sequels, so I'm not gonna be covering them this month. But if you need to know what I think of them in the meantime, here's a quick little rundown. Two is a horror masterpiece. Three is a huge fall from grace. Four is a guilty pleasure and has its moments. Five is pretty good, even though it wasn't a Hellraiser script originally. Six is fair, even though it wasn't a Hellraiser script originally. Seven is not great and wasn't a Hellraiser script originally. Eight is stupid fun, but wasn't a Hellraiser script originally. I haven't seen any of the sequels past Hellworld, but I probably should. So after the major success of Hellraiser, how did Barker respond? Well, let's find out next time when we talk about Nightbreed. Thank you so much for watching, and stay spooky, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. If you like what I do and want to support the channel, please consider subscribing or by buying me a coffee in the description below. Any bit helps. Thank you, and take care.